Welcome to Paranormality Magazine. Each week, Paranormality Magazine explores all Fortean subjects, from phantoms to UFOs and every cryptid creature in between. Each week, you're treated to a collection of well-researched and investigated stories, interviews, and reports on cutting-edge paranormal projects and topics they know you crave. And here in the podcast, I share stories from the magazine to give you just a taste of what you receive in every issue. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Paranormality Magazine. What do you get when you cross a Southern California house, two wrestling enthusiasts, a mafia don, and an alcoholic husband who will stop at nothing to kill his adoring wife? You get the curious haunting of the Moffat family in Rancho Cucamonga, California. And Molly Briggs from Paranormality Magazine has the story for us. Between 1987 and 1991, the Moffat family lived in indescribable fear. It's a tale at terrifying heights. Strange messages written in soap on mirrors within the home, and mattresses torn to shreds with no explanation were some of the bizarre happenings. Multiple accounts of hair-raising events shrouded the Moffat family in fear for over six years, living with a demon they nicknamed Mr. Entity. The family would eventually allege that this demon was responsible for scratching a specific symbol into the surface of their cars, burning it into walls, and carving it into a rug inside the home. Deborah, the daughter-in-law of Mr. and Mrs. Moffat, would recall the eerie, demonic carving as a triangle with a small tail extending out of the base. In 1986, Deborah was living in New York. Through her interest in the WWE, she met Bill Moffat. After falling in love, they married and decided to reside in sunny Southern California. Citing his deep love and desired protection of his mother from his abusive alcoholic father, Bill Jr. convinced his new bride to live at home with his parents. It wasn't long before Deborah was front and center to the mental paranormal torture that would hold their young family hostage for the better part of six years. As far as strange activity in the home, some might say, why didn't the family just move? Well, for the Moffat family, it wasn't that easy. The original dwelling was a property that included a large lot with three homes, all of which seemed to be stricken with some accounts of paranormal activity. One account Deborah personally witnessed, including multiple objects mysteriously transporting from one place to another. For other reasons, the family sold the property and moved to a larger home nearby. Unfortunately, the paranormal activity continued and increased. The four Moffats lived under the same roof. Soon after their first son was born, a terrifying event sent Bill's parents, Lee and Bill Sr., out of their second-floor bedroom and into the sleeping quarters of their son, a room he shared with his new wife and child. Mr. Entity had dramatically sliced Lee and Bill Sr.'s mattress into pieces. With no earthly explanation for this, Lee Moffat was afraid. Her husband, on the other hand, was hardly moved. He seemed indifferent to the entire situation. Here's where it gets weird. One would argue that if the strange and horrifying event did not phase Lee's husband, that would assume he had done it. The short answer is no, he was likely not the culprit, given that the paranormal activity continued after he was forced from the home. One fateful day, he was caught by none other than Deborah, his daughter-in-law, having a conversation with the demon through letters written in soap on a mirror. He was pleading with the entity to kill his wife, Lee, so that he would gain control of her finances and inherit the massive amount of money left to her by her parents. Lee's father was an influential member of the Cosa Nostra, or the Sicilian Mafia crime family in California. So much wealth was likely to be had. Money is an unfortunate but familiar motive. The story is a puzzle, and here is another piece. In 1989, a paranormal investigator shared that the reason this entity had not left the home was because someone in the home was permitting it to stay. 
It would be years later that Deborah would encounter her father-in-law engaging with Mr. Entity. Once revealed, Bill Sr. was exiled from the home and left the state. Again, the activity continued indicating Bill Sr.'s innocence. Strange events continued to plague the home in Alta Loma. Prince, aka Mr. Entity, would consistently write of his hate for Lee all over the home, leaving strange symbols etched on the floors and walls, items moving by themselves, lights turning on and off without intervention, and doors opening and slamming shut when no one was within reach. TV channels would also change by an unseen power. No Escape and I Hate Lee are just a couple of the messages left by the demonic entity. Deborah's pleas to have the house investigated went unanswered until after the father left and Lee was paralyzed with fear. Priests, holy water, and paranormal investigators invaded the home. Two investigators prompted laughter from the demon that came from the second floor. Every attempt at thwarting the evil entity was futile. Deborah finally took matters into her own hands. After years of torture and severe mental anguish, she mustered every ounce of courage she had and demanded the entity leave. Shortly after that, a simple message was written on the mirror. Goodbye, family. And that was it. That was the end of the haunting of the Moffat family. Although that wasn't the end of the fear. Both Bill Jr. and his mother Lee lived in fear of the demon until they died. The mother in 2009 and Bill Jr. in 2012. Bill Jr.'s daughter would later recall escorting her timid father around the home after dark, wondering why he seemed scared of his own shadow. She would also remember her grandmother lurking around the home similarly. You see, the children of the Moffat family were never told of the demon until after the children had come of age. They were protected from the bizarre stories until Deborah felt safe leaving the closet, which she most certainly did with a box of pictures showcasing the paranormal circus she had lived through for the better part of her early marriage to the young Bill Moffat. At the time of the haunting, the children of Bill Jr. were too young to comprehend the chaos going on within the home. Since then, books have been written and podcasts have been produced about the strange activities inside the Moffat home in Rancho Cucamonga, California. Some have chosen to believe it, and some have not. It is a peculiar and curious tale that leads me to wonder how mighty the hand is that reaches over to us from the dark side and whether it influences us or if we influence it. Which is the darker hand? We take a brief moment now to look at a member of the Fortean Society, Alexander Woolcott. Alexander Humphreys Wolcott was born January 19, 1887, in Phalanx, New Jersey, to a struggling inventor father who passed away when Wolcott was just nine. This left mom to raise him and his two sisters alone in constrained financial circumstances. From a young age, Wolcott found solace in writing and theater. He attended Hamilton College in Clinton, New York, where he edited the student newspaper contributed short stories to magazines, and participated in campus drama productions. After graduating in 1909, he bounced around journalism jobs before gaining attention as the drama critic for the New York Times from 1914 to 1922 and then the New York Herald from 1922 to 1928. Woolcott gained national fame in the 1920s and 30s as a founding member of the Algonquin Round Table a group of writers, critics, and actors who met daily for lunch at Manhattan's Algonquin Hotel. Known for his savage wit, creative insults, and vicious theater reviews, Woolcott established himself as one of the most entertaining and quoted drama critics of his generation. Though he longed for an estate in the countryside, Woolcott made his home in hotel suites in midtown Manhattan for most of his adult life. There, he hosted lavish parties, often with themes requiring elaborate costumes for his diverse roster of friends and contacts. He never married or had children, but maintained correspondences with dozens of celebrities and authors of the day. In the 1930s, Woolcott became enamored by the supernatural and the occult. He was an avid reader of pulp science fiction and fantasy stories. 
1932, he joined the Fordian Society, an organization dedicated to chronicling strange and inexplicable phenomena founded by novelist Tiffany Thayer. Wolcott remained a member until his death, contributing articles about bizarre events to the Fordian Society's magazine, Doubt. Though struggling with his health later in life, Wolcott enjoyed national fame and influence at the peak of his career. From 1937 to 1942, he hosted The Town Crier, a popular CBS radio program. His final book, As You Were, published weeks before his death, became one of 1943's top sellers. On January 23, 1943, at the age of 56, Wolcott suffered a fatal heart attack during a live radio broadcast. His sudden death shocked the country and made front-page headlines. Over 600 people attended his elaborate star-studded funeral held at a church in Manhattan. In his personal writings, Wolcott admitted sensitivity about never finding romantic love. However, he maintained many deep and lasting platonic friendships, exchanging thousands of letters with fellow literati over his lifetime. His distinctive style and rapier wit live on in perpetuity through archived columns, stories, and broadcasts. Though Wolcott's cruel theater reviews caused immense resentment amongst some Broadway talents, generations of readers and theatergoers found lasting entertainment and escapism in his written words. His longevity as one of the most widely quoted American wits and critics of the early 20th century is perhaps the sweetest posthumous revenge against those he once eviscerated on the stage and page. Jorge Martinez tells us about the Unseen War, Spiritual Battles Haunting Soldiers. Upon learning of the suicides of several haunted Marines, I recalled childhood experiences years later known as paranormal. Regretfully, at the time there were no newly coined phrases one could use. Unable to name or describe them, I did what millions before me did. I buried them in my subconscious. I did what every Catholic child would have done. I prayed for protection from evil. Unable to tell anyone, I suffered in silence, filled with dread of visions, voices, and movements in the dark. Many years later, as an adult, I shared my perceptions with several advanced students of the occult and Mexican curanderos along the Texas border. To my dismay, no one could help. Although many claimed to know, none really did. Unlike many students of the paranormal, I had no desire for vengeance, power, or wealth. I simply sought relief from constant fear and dread. The struggle continued throughout my adolescence. Later, while in the military, I researched literature from many countries via books of different religions and cultures. All of them contained studies of the occult, but none helped. I came to an unpleasant conclusion. Usable knowledge cannot be gained by reading, but only by risking your life and spiritual self. Had I not been desperate, I would have never considered it. Profoundly disturbing was the absence of knowledgeable people willing to help. After publishing several books on the paranormal under a pseudonym, I attempted to share my knowledge believing I would save others. Again, I was disappointed none of my students were able to defeat self-importance enough to obtain the necessary discipline to enhance their lives. They either saw themselves as knowledgeable and powerful or totally helpless. This was overwhelming, and imagine the frustration others must have felt. My obsession was born of desperation and indignation of having been subjected to knowledge I also never wanted. I regretfully recognize I am an unwilling descendant of other victims of paranormal experiences they also never sought, but were real nonetheless. As mankind unveils secrets and once unbelievable possibilities become realities, such as extraterrestrials, knowledge of the occult will unfortunately be exposed. This is inevitable as mankind overcomes boundaries of understanding. Although we are not there yet, so as to prove my point in a recent New York Times article on November 5, 2023, two Marines, having returned from a secret mission to Syria wherein they shelled villages and enemy strongholds, 
reported being haunted by the spirits of children. As it was for me as a child, these men had no place to seek refuge. Repeated reports of aberrations brought no peace, and neither did the drugs they were given. The men, both gunners of Alpha Battery 1st Battalion 11th Marines of Camp Pendleton, California, killed themselves. Many others remain impacted by their experiences. The horrific reality is there is nowhere these men could have gone for help, as it doesn't exist. Via their own decisions and behavior, these Marines crossed into a sphere wherein modern medicine has no authority. Unable to recognize or acknowledge the possibility these men transgressed into a spiritual realm, the Marine Corps and modern medicine abandoned them. Forgetting that while the Middle East is known as the Holy Land, it is also the first recorded place evil appeared. The Jewish and Christian Bible report evil appeared to Jesus who defeated it and went on to perform endless miracles. The miracles are recorded as examples of his supernatural power, and yet the occult is never considered when someone is believed possessed or haunted. The only book I have found offering genuine guidelines toward spiritual warfare was written by an unknown author. Don Jesus M. Ramirez in 2012, luckily still offered on Amazon. Interestingly, Marine Corps leaders and doctors may claim to believe in God, but none honestly do. None were willing to consider these men were truly under a spiritual attack and that the rest of the 1st Battalion, 11th Marines may be as well. Clearly, there exists a separation between trust, faith, and fidelity, as our military leaders are lying or are horribly negligent in their responsibilities. While we claim, in God we trust, clearly those in charge don't and never have. Once having been caught in the same catch-22 between the church and average people, I know what it's like to feel abandoned, called crazy, stared at, suspected of lying, and hated for claiming something most people rarely do. Unlike the Marines who killed themselves after years of torment, unable to find peace or solace, I, by the grace of God, survived. Unable to overcome or completely understand my experience, I sought refuge in the study of the occult. I believe in what is known as the supernatural. Playful experimentation in this field should be cautioned against vehemently. While the Catholic Church reports exorcism, it has regretfully and inexplicably condemned us to remain ignorant of how to combat dark forces that attack us. Even though spiritual energy has been witnessed and scientifically recorded, society remains ignorant of its existence and power. My heart breaks for those men and their families. The men of the cloth wearing military uniforms have failed their oath to God and country. Apparently, the Marine gunners who described their visions to Marine Corps doctors died from an unacknowledged religious epiphany. Want more paranormality? Subscribe to Paranormality Magazine, and each month get it delivered digitally or via mail in our print version. Paranormality Magazine is a collaborative endeavor featuring works from people like you who have a passion for all things mysterious and unexplained. Our goal is the pursuit of knowledge, gathering captivating stories from our own team of writers, researchers, and investigators, as well as from writers such as yourself. Each monthly issue also includes a list of paranormal, horror, UFO, and cryptozoology events around the country incredible paranormal-themed artwork, articles and writing sent in from our readers, suggested books and podcasts to consume, and more. Visit ParanormalityMag.com and subscribe today for as little as $3.99 a month. That's ParanormalityMag.com. ParanormalityMag.com. Meet Ralph Lale, a furniture salesman who was scouting a mountain in North Carolina that was famous for what was called the Brown Mountain Lights. 
On certain nights, many claimed that mysterious lights would rise up from the forest and into the skies. Pre-1947 and the beginning of the UFO craze, they were believed by Native Americans and early settlers to be spirit lights. But of course, after? But back to Ralph. He encountered these lights, and in a very direct way, saying, I'm frightened, don't know what to do. One light moves forward. It's now about 10 feet from me and it's glowing. I can read a newspaper by the shining of it. It's 10 to 12 feet across, almost a perfect circle. It has a brown center that does not look solid. The shape of the brown center is like a tumble bug but without a head standing on its back end, not touching the ground but suspended in the center of the glowing ball. It seems to have three hands or feelers protruding out from each side. Ralph claimed in the book that he wrote about his experience that after learning to communicate with the light using basic yes and no questions, it led him through crystal-walled tunnels into a secret cave base in the mountain where he met an alien race called the Puam. They took him to the planet Venus, which he said was made entirely of crystal, warned him about the dangers of nuclear science, and totally let him nail a hot alien chick named Noma who showed up to greet him in just a bra and panties. Yeah. That too. I kind of want to get abducted now. Anyway, after he was brought back, he says that he found a small mummified alien body in one of the caves and he brought it back to town where he displayed it in a glass case in his furniture store for years until he died and the store was bulldozed. And no one knows what happened to the body. Naturally, stories of the men in black showing covering up evidence immediately surfaced, but many have more reasonably tied the mummy to being a sideshow attraction created by the legendary Homer Tate. Regardless of its earthly or unearthly origins, we still don't know what happened to it. Okay, so Venus isn't made of crystal, and Ralph was almost certainly a huckster trying to attract folks coming to see the lights, which appear to be a real and probably natural occurring phenomenon but it's certainly more fun to imagine Ralph on a sexy space adventure. That being said, while the Ralph Lale story draws considerable interest to the area, especially when it comes to the idea of hollow caverns occupied by extraterrestrial beings, it is far from the first story to make this kind of claim. Not far away from Brown Mountain, Chimney Mountain was the site of a similar event that took place 150 years before Ralph's encounter and Chaz of the Dead from Paranormality Magazine brings us this story. It was 1806, and Patsy Reeves was left in charge of the family homestead outside of Rutherford, North Carolina, after her husband died a few years prior. She lived there with three children and raised them with the most likely involuntary help of an African-American woman who, of course, remains unnamed throughout the report. One evening at about 6 p.m., two of the children were out playing, when one of them noticed something strange occurring on the mountain face opposite them. One of the children, an eight-year-old girl named Elizabeth, said she saw a strange man on the mountain who seemed busy moving large sticks and rolling large rocks down the mountainside. She soon realized this man was not alone but a part of a large group, all of whom were busy. She quickly ran to her brother, a boy named Morgan, age 11, who did not believe his sister at first. After some prodding, though, the brother went to investigate his sister's claim and, to his surprise, he did not only see strange people on the side of the mountain, but he saw thousands of things flying in the air. He quickly got the attention of the rest of the house occupants, his mother, the third sibling, and their presumably enslaved help. The mother told a local newspaper what she saw when she arrived. The quote from the newspaper is, "...she discovered a very numerous crowd of beings resembling the human species but could not discern any particular members of the human body nor distinction of sexes, that they were of every size, from the tallest men down to the least infants, that there were more of the small than of the full-grown, that they were all clad with brilliant white raiment, but could not describe any form of their garment, that they appeared to rise off the mountain south of said rock, and about as high, that a considerable part of the mountain's top was visible about this shining host, that they moved in a northern direction and collected about the top of Chimney Rock. It becomes clear that these white beings that they're describing as men are they themselves the flying things. After the crowd slowly continued moving towards the large bare peak known as Chimney Rock, a few of these largest men beings of the group 
seemed to rise up above the rock and a few more from below started to weave through the crowd of beings at impossible speeds. Mrs. Reeves was so amazed that she sent a messenger to reach a nearby neighbor, one Robert Searcy. Robert initially dismissed the messenger using classic 1800s man logic, believing that the women and children were delusional. After the messenger was sent back a second time, he reluctantly followed and met the other onlookers in their yard. At his first glance of the mountain, he saw nothing and began to walk off, when the other insisted he look again. He looked more closely this time and saw what the others had. He was quoted in the paper as saying, he saw more glittering white appearances of humankind that ever had he seen of men at any general view, that they moved in throngs, moved in a semicircular course between him and the rock. The sighting lasted for about an hour before the entities seemed to notice the group watching them and flew over to investigate them. The report states that they got within 20 yards of the group before disappearing. Robert Searcy said they vanished out of sight, leaving a solemn and pleasing impression on the mind, accompanied with a diminution of body strength. This altered state they were left in, a slight buzz and physical weakness, could be construed as side effects of a psychedelic experience. What were these entities doing? They seemed to be, at first, moving things across the face of the mountain, before they gathered together on one of the peaks. Their floating and glowing nature is reminiscent of the brown mountain lights, but these were certainly more humanoid. Were these entities digging out and preparing the subterranean alien base that Ralph Leal described? Unlikely, but impossible to say for sure. One thing we do know is this is surprisingly not the first account of possible extraterrestrials standing in this area. In fact, the next example takes us back 400 million years. To explain this, though, our story starts with a weird incident in 1968. A man named Melvin R. Gray was mowing his lawn in Louisville, Kentucky, when his lawnmower ran over something. At first glance, this thing seemed to be nothing more than a typical rock. But for whatever reason, Mr. Gray decided to hold on to the oddly colored and shaped rock. Over the next seven months, he began to analyze the rock he came to the conclusion that this rock was actually a fossil, and not just a regular fossil. It was a fossilized UFO and occupants. The story was covered by two paranormal periodicals at the time, and one of which was written by respected researcher Brad Steiger. Steiger observed the object and was, like the rest of us, extremely skeptical of this alien interpretation but he was also sent the description of the entities and plaster casts made from the fossil, and despite his skepticism, he did say of one of these plasters that he could see a tiny human pilot sitting in a bucket-type seat when he used a magnifying glass. This was one of several entities that Mr. Gray believed were contained in the fossil. Mr. Gray claimed to have been able to see seven distinctive entities inside the fossil. The little creatures were in segmented areas he was convinced were actually a fossilized craft that was around them. Three of the creatures he described were ape-like, but also noted could very well be humanoids in special spacesuits. The other three were more human-looking. He said the groups were divided into sections that seemed manufactured and that lined up and fitted together. He said that this indicates intelligent construction and design by intelligent beings. Of the whole thing, he told Brad Steiger, the fossilized creatures themselves are humanoid in appearance, looking very much like ourselves and approximately three inches tall. The stone looks rather cindery, as if it may have hurtled through a long trail of space, melting as it went and finally splashing into some river or lake before it was entirely consumed, leaving a fossil-like imprint for a permanent record to tell the world that we had visitors to our Earth who had met with some terrible calamity. For this version of events to be accurate, this pan-sized spacecraft would have had to crash on the Earth's surface 400 million years ago for it to become fossilized in this manner. Now, of course, there isn't much to back up this claim. It seems the object, much like the alien mummy mentioned earlier, has disappeared. 
Many point to this as some kind of show of credibility, that someone is hiding it away. But the chance it's sitting in a box in an attic somewhere is equally, if not more, probable. Whatever the true nature of these accounts, they serve to show that this area has a strange significance when it comes to these paranormal subjects. The area seems to constantly break the mold of what to expect from the paranormal. Thanks for listening to Paranormality Magazine. Get more information about the magazine and subscribe to our monthly publication at ParanormalityMag.com. That's ParanormalityMag.com. Or click the link in the show description. And if you're a researcher or investigator, send us your stories. We might feature you in our next issue. If you have a paranormal podcast, you can add it to our website so our readers can find your show. And artists, if you'd like your work to be featured in our magazine or on our back cover, contact us. Again, our website is paranormalitymag.com. I'm Darren Marlar, and I'll have more paranormal for you next time from Paranormality Magazine. Exchanging thousands of letters with fellow litter. Exchanging thousands of letters with fellow. Exchanging thousands of letters with fellow literari over his lifetime. Literacy. Exchanging thousands of letters with fellow literati over his lifetime.